Jake Nickel is the founder of Threadless, and Jeffrey Kalmakoff is the C uh, chief creative officer. Um, I'd like to go ahead and welcome them out. Come on, guys. Wait, wait, wait. I'm just taking a picture. I want to send it. I think Jake's sending that to his also. mom or something. Can I get, every, can I get everyone to wave to my mom real quick? Awesome, thank you. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, guys. That was a loud throat clear. Yeah, it was. <laughs> this couch is really comfortable. Yeah, it's comfortable for you because you have long legs. I have to sit up here at the very front to try not to fall backwards. Um, you know what, let's start by asking, guys, um, how many people here know of Threadless? Wow. How many are customers? How many of you are wearing a Threadless t-shirt today? Several. Very nice. All right, you guys are in good shape. Um, most of you guys do know, but obviously some people in the audience, for, for those who, who don't know about Threadless, can we just start off with sort of summary of, of what is Threadless? Um, I guess the quick version is that uh, Threadless is an ongoing open call for t-shirt design submissions um, where artists can uh, design to a template and upload it. It gets scored for seven days. Um, and uh, people vote on the designs, which creates a pool of the highest scoring from which we choose, and then uh, print designs from the highest scoring. And we release nine new shirts so we can uh, pay the designers uh, the equivalent of, well, $2,000 in cash and a $500 gift certificate for every design printed. Great. Now, um, people think of you as this scrappy new startup on the scene. You guys actually, Threadless will be 10 years old next year, is that right? Yeah, we started in November of 2000, so 2010 is our 10-year anniversary. Um, you know, it started as a hobby back then, and it's kind of grown a little bit since then. But yeah. Can you give people a sense of the size of the company, how many people, how many users, how many shirts you've sold? Sure, right now we have about a million users. We've got about 800,000 people on our newsletter. We get 150 to 200 designs submitted per day. Um, we're selling about 100,000 t-shirts a month. And, and then as far as the community goes, um, I mean, there's, there's uh, any registered user can blog on the site, which um, kind of gets pushed into like an aggregate view um, that looks like a uh, forum listing. And we get, um, many hundreds of new blog posts and uh, thousands of replies and there's thousands of uh, votes per design in, in a day mm -hmm. so it's a, a very large community so you started this company in 2000 so it was the dot-com bus tell us why did you start threadless well um, threadless was not started to be a business um, I was a member of an art forum called dreamless in 2000 and I just uh, found it to be fun to share artwork with other users on there and um, kind of came up with this idea that uh, this art could be made into real life objects and uh, you know because everything was really digital back then um, as far, on this forum at least <laughs> everything <laughs> but, uh, back then was digital okay yeah so everybody was just kind of sharing art digitally um, and we found out that t-shirts makes a really great canvas for art and they're easy to print and you know nobody can have too many t-shirts. Um, so <laughs> we allowed people to just start submitting designs and we printed the best ones and sold them. But you know, I was working a full-time job and going to school part-time for the first two years of the project, shipping orders during my lunch break and not taking a dime for myself. Every, every penny that came in was just used to print more shirts. Um, so it was really just a fun, exciting thing to do for this community that I was a part of. Do you consider yourself an accidental entrepreneur? Absolutely, yeah. yeah I mean. <laughs> All right, so you guys have been held up as sort of the Harvard Business School example of crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing is something that, you know, I think a lot of people in this audience are trying to figure out how to do, but it's also um, has something of a, of a dark side in this community, some examples that have, um, that have come out that, that, that don't use the, uh, the principle very well. Can you talk about where your line is, both with Threadless and then the other examples you see in the industry of people using crowdsourcing? Where do you think the line falls when it's used well versus when it's not used well? Um, I, th I think that 
it's used well if it's if it's done in a way that um, it just sort of maintains uh, openness of content. Um, the way you know the way that we use it is uh, it's not so much a contest because there's really no start and end date, and you're really not competing against anyone. I mean, if you're competing against anything, you're competing against um, time. How how good of a score can you get in seven days? Um, you know, we don't look for anything in particular except for what's new. So um, there's nobody saying, you know, we're looking for, uh, you know, a, a shirt with a, a blue duck, you know, with, a, uh, with one wing up and it's, you know, it's eating a, another duck. Or something. Yeah, Threadless I mean, is like, just, <laughs> it's just the artwork, you know, I mean. But someone should submit that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the whole that, spec that work debate, it's like. Problems. I mean, on Threadless, it's, you're just submitting artwork that you'd be creating anyway. It's, uh, it's a hobby that people have, and this is just a constructive use of that hobby. Um, I think that an artist should still make a painting even if they're not, they don't have a buyer, you know? Right. Whereas some of the other projects that you see uh, popping up right now, it's kind of like you have to create this super specific thing in order to have a chance at winning. I think another good example of um, like a, like an excellent use of crowdsourcing is um, Lego does um, spacing on the name of the of the project. If anyone knows, shout it out. But basically, you can um, you can use any of their pieces to create anything, um, and you do it online. And people basically get to vote on which designs they like the best, and, the, and then they'll actually turn these kits into actual kits and give. Um, you know, they give credit, give to, credit the to the creator. I mean, and that could be like a kid. Actually, there was the one who got used the most was actually a kid. Mm -hmm. And it's all done online. And, you know, so it really it's saying use anything we have. It, we're not looking for anything specific. Just be ultra creative and we'll let the crowd decide which is the best. And then we'll turn that into a, you know, an actual product. So you're really talking about the difference between crowdsourcing and sort of spec work. And then you're, there seems to be something in here about the intention of the person Who's, who's submitting and what they're going to get out of it. So, I mean, you want to talk a little bit more about what your designers get out of being involved with Threadless? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, when you submit a design to Threadless, we don't own it. When your design is chosen to be printed, we still don't own it. So um, we copyright the design on the artist's behalf um, and get the rights to print it on a T-shirt. But that artist can still you know, make a poster out of it or do anything else, really, that they want to do with that design. Um, and as far as prizing goes, you know, we, we give the artist $2,000 cash, which is... <laughs> it's like four to five times the industry standard of a, of a t-shirt design, even if you were like a really well-known artist working for a really well-known brand. Mm -hmm. So we, we, try and, we try and create an environment that's, um, that's super beneficial to the uh, designer, both, you know, from a sort of prizing stance, you know, if they get printed, but also, um, it's, not, it's not creating a competitive environment where designers are against other designers. Um, our forums are super active with people being supportive of each other. We have a critique section where if you're not sure if your design is really up to par, you can um, gauge feedback and uh, give different iterations and have people say whether or not they like it and use their feedback before you even submit it. Mm -hmm. So really, it's... You know, it, it is a really supportive creative community where they're, you know, they're learning critique, they're getting better, there's, you know, it's really not like submit and if, if you don't get chosen, like, sorry, like, it doesn't really end there. Right. So, and it's, so it's not and it's just the money, it's not just the fame, but it's also this, this community that get to be involved with and the support around it. Yeah, I mean, back when I was a member of Dreamless and, the, you know, this art community that it came from, I was submitting artwork to the community all the time and there was no possibility of getting any money from that. You know, it's just a hobby. Mm -hmm. So people think of the user-generated content of Threadless as being the t-shirts, but there's this enormous amount of user-generated content in the blogs and the forums. Um, you've talked about the interactions on the site um, and what those mean to the users and how those can be shared. Do you want to talk about where that is now and where you're going to go with that? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously as... Obviously, as um, sort of like the social web kind of moves along and there's all these other opportunities to um, basically share content, I think if you kind of go back to the beginning of Threadless, um, I mean, a lot of the sort of web 2.0 principles we were doing um, as a function of our company before web 
2.0 as a name existed and before Web 2.0 as like a technology existed. I mean, you know, we were doing crowdsourcing, we were doing all these things in the beginning. Um, but there's and so many... Our way of uh, allowing people to share content was giving them an email that they could then forward to their friends. Right. <laughs> or, you know, whereas now there's all these different tools that you can be using to share content. Yeah, one, I mean, one of the things that we're, um, we're gonna be doing pretty soon um, as we kind of roll into our 10th version of our website is um, integrating Facebook Connect, which allows basically all, I mean, it basically allows all interactions on the site to become content. So, um, you know, if, and we've been, you know, spending a lot of time looking at these moments where you can be sharing whether you're submitting a design or um, voting on a design, uh, posting a, a blog post, commenting, any of that stuff where basically the interaction becomes content um, and then people are consuming, especially if they know about Threadless, it's a it's content that people want to be consuming, they want to know that people are participating. Right. So that, that's got to be great marketing for you guys. So let's talk about marketing for a second. We have a lot of marketers here in the audience. Do you do anything that resembles traditional marketing? We do very little. I think the one thing that we do that does resemble traditional marketing is our newsletter. Mm -hmm. um, every week we send out a newsletter to our base of 800,000 subscribers just showing them what their, the new shirts are. Mm -hmm. And that has been one of the most effective things we have done outside of the non-traditional marketing things that are just inherently built into Threadless, which is the word of mouth stuff. I mean, when somebody spends five hours or two days, you know, creating a design, obviously when they submit it, they're really going to want to show everybody that and uh, share that, get people to score it and try to have the design printed. Why don't you put the Threadless logo on the tees? Um, it, you know, it, it's, not, it's not really about the brand as, a, as you know, the, the, being in the spotlight. Um, it's really about the brand being the facilitator to the design. Um, you know, we, like we've gotten offers to have our stuff sold, you know, like Urban Outfitters and Target and all these sort of places. And um, the issue with that is when you take the story away from the t-shirts um, and you sort of, you know, create a disconnect between how the, you know, between the designer and the t-shirt, it's, you know, we're just, you know, a shirt and ink on a, you know, on a wall with some other shirts, and I mean, not to say that our shirts, you know, aren't, you know, many thousands of times more beautiful than the other shirts, but, um, <laughs> you know, they really. Are. <laughs> well, I mean, for me, when starting Threadless, or even before then, when I was growing up, I wasn't one to wear brand names. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, most of the shirts that I wore in high school were band t-shirts, because I was supporting an artist, and um, I just think that knowing the story behind what you're representing to the people who are looking at you is much more powerful than just wearing a brand and right. you know that carries through and the fact that Threadless isn't written anywhere on the shirt except for in the tag mm -hmm. but and I mean and also you know what, what we're trying to accomplish with our brand isn't really to create a brand identity which I guess is sort of opposite of a lot of what brands do, you know. I mean, with Nike, you've got the swoosh, you know, with McDonald's, you can see certain colors and think McDonald's, you know. Basically, what we're trying to do with our brand is have it represent everything that you haven't seen before. So, I mean, that, it, that goes into how we choose what designs get printed. We're interested in who's moving things forward. Mm -hmm. So, it's kind of, it's kind of, it would be silly of us to think that we could create a brand identity out of constantly changing what the you know, what the vision of the brand is. Mm -hmm. So you've, um, as accidental entrepreneurs, um, you have start, You obviously are evolving your business. We talked a little bit yesterday about um, marketing partnerships that you're starting to do and how you've evolved your understanding of how to approach those. So tell us a little bit about what's next in terms of the, of the Threadless brand. Sure, yeah, the, what you're speaking to, I think, is kind of like our whole partnership thing. I mean. Over the past five years, we've had a lot of companies that have wanted to work with Threadless, and we haven't done a good job of figuring out exactly how to form a partnership with other companies. <laughs> so, uh, and why is that? You know, in the past, what we've done is <clears throat> other companies that we think are cool, or or bands, or magazines, or we've kind of uh, done these design challenges, um, but we haven't. You know, like we would be. We would be doing the, one of the official shirts for, say, like Lollapalooza, but we weren't saying, hey, Lollapalooza, why don't you tell 
all the people that you know, sign up to your newsletter that we're doing this. Or, yeah. In other words, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, we just see a lot of potential there, and we know nothing about business development. <clears throat> so we're looking for some help there. Yeah. So, yeah, I and mean, now you do know what you're doing. We're getting there. We know yeah. that we're not doing it right. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, we're, we're getting there. We're, you know, the whole idea of uh, reciprocal promotion is something that we think about when we're, you know, arranging a partnership. Um, you know, I mean, not to say that the partnerships were bad before mm. because, like, we kind of have this ethic where we never worked with anyone we didn't like and we would never take money to do a promotion with us mm -hmm. um, because we felt that by taking money that created an obligation to potentially do things that we didn't want to do. Um, so really we were just like, oh yeah, we're this cool brand and we just want to do these cool promotions. And you know, the marketing teams at these other companies were like, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we were like, really, you know, like we were helping yeah. to market movies, we were helping to market video game launches, uh, huge festivals, different stuff like that. And we were just like, oh yeah, no problem, we'll put you, you know, front page, above the fold, in our newsletter for four weeks, no problem. And then we just, it wouldn't, be, and then we'd be like high-fiving each other and being like, we're helping to launch Little Miss Sunshine, this is awesome. And there's like <laughs> nothing on Little Miss Sunshine at all that has our name on it. Yeah. So. We should have asked you guys to promote Web2 Expo before yeah. you got a clue, right? <laughs> yeah, right. All right, so one thing you, you definitely have known, uh, do know what, how to do is, is work with your users and your community and, and sort of bring them along with all the changes that you need to make. So think about, you know, every time Facebook changes the layout, there's this giant user revolt. Have you guys had that experience? And if so, what have you done about it? Yeah, um, in the beginning, we changed our website like every six months. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, entirely, completely new redesign because that was... It what I fun. like to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, designer run um, company. <laughs> yeah, and now we still make changes pretty often, but they're not as drastic. Mm -hmm. But what we do do that I think has been really successful is as soon as we make a change, we sit on the blogs listening to what everybody has to say. And changes that are obvious and easy to do, we make like within a half an hour. Mm -hmm. And then um, we sit down and, you know, we let things settle for 24 hours or so and then we really look into what people are saying after 24 hours because that's when the dust has settled a little bit and uh, at that moment we tend to make even more changes. I mean, and we can tell the difference obviously between something that, some change that we made that's sort of integral to our business that we can't, you know, like if, if it's a huge meeting about a certain thing and it's a step in a direction that, you know, can't really change it because it's sort of setting the new path. Um, you know, really what we do is we just keep that communication open. And I, I mean, I think that that's, you know, kind of telling of how we do things is um, we do, we have to keep that communication open because our entire business is built on a trust relationship. Right. So if something can't be changed, we let people know why it can't be changed. And if it can be changed, our point of view is um, it's, it's not worth making people upset over something that is only that way because we thought it should look that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I as a designer, if I design a button to be a certain size and a certain color and people are saying it's too big and it's, you know, conflicting with the way that they're used to interacting with the site, it's really, it's, it becomes an ego thing. It's like, well, this is the way that I wanted it, which but really... Another, another reason we don't really have revolts like that is because the changes that we make in the first place tend to come from the community. Right. right. So, I mean, they're... The community is rarely asking agree, for this stuff anyway. so... <laughs> Do you find there's a high degree of consensus in your community, or? No, I mean, everybody has their opinions for sure, but I mean, there's kind of like, we, we see that there's, they're not like black and white. It's kind of just coming together to form the. But I think that's where it's super important to stay really involved because um, it's not easy to sort of jump into a conversation that's been going on for three days where you've got 1,500 posts and really be able to feel like you can just dive in and catch the average of what people are saying and be able to, you know, you really need to be part of the conversation. I mean, that's something, I mean, what's funny is if we launch something, usually somebody blogs about it before we even get a chance within that, like, 30-second period to post the news about the change. Mm -hmm. so, so it's sort of, wow. you know, so we, we generally need to be involved right away and, like, be there to answer questions. So instead of it turning into people complaining, it's people directing it, you know, to somebody who can actually make the change. And then it's the difference between, you know, this, like, mob of people complaining about why, you know, they decided to do this um, 
versus just talking to us directly, and then if it makes sense, we can just go ahead and switch it. You spend a lot of time in this forum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think if someone came to you and said, and I think this probably happens to you fairly often, we, our company does X, Y, and Z, and we want to be the threadless of our industry, what do you say to them? Um, you know, I think, I feel like in order to really do it right, what we're doing, the company needs to be able to just flip upside down and, and realize that they're no longer in charge. You know, their community is in charge. You don't have the last say anymore. And that's like a huge step for, I mean, I, I don't think a lot of com companies are ready to actually do that. Like they may say, yeah, we care about our customers and we care about our community, but are you really ready to give them control? I also think that, um, I mean, if, if, I, if there's a company that, and this has happened before, that says, you know, we want to do this, I mean, usually my first question is why? Um, why? And it's not meant to say, like, oh, you can't do it or whatever, but really, I think that the misconception about crowdsourcing is that it's, is that it's this sort of, like, easy kind of um, way to shortcut spending money um, and being able to get things for free and it's yeah. just you know thinking that you can just like activate your customer base and turn them into your community and the reality is that um, I mean crowdsourcing is just proving itself as being another viable way of doing business it's yeah. not any better of, it's not better than traditional business it's just different and if there's a company that's doing traditional business and it has a top-down structure Making the switch to crowdsourcing, like Jake said, turning it on its head, I mean, I would say that 90% of the time, it's about as realistic as, like, making the decision to, you know, sort of swap out the foundation on a skyscraper, right. you know? <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's, it's possible, but it's going to upset the ecosystem of the building for so long that it's going to, you know, you're basically starting from zero anyways, you might as well just start a whole new company. There's baby steps that companies can take, though. I think that the best thing that a company can do to start interacting with their community more is to look at your products and then look at how people are using them differently than you expected. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's what Lego did. You know, they, they saw that this, per this kid bought 10 Lego sets, but he found that if I use some parts from this and some parts from this to build this new thing, you know, there's a whole community around that now. Lego built an entire community around that. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, also I think that it's, it's, it's worth spending time thinking about whether or not your customer base has the potential to be an active community, right? If you sell, you know, you know, abrasive cleaning solvents for, you know, your bathroom, mm -hmm. you know, where it's a necessary product, like, are there really people out there that are so passionate about toilet cleaning that they're going to participate and get, you know what I mean? It's like, um, and I think, and it's something that obviously we'll talk about later. We'll mm -hmm. plug our little panel. Yes. But, um, but I mean, We're you know. Doing a panel called um, uh, Corralling the Crowdsource Community this afternoon with uh, Jake and um, Jen Beckman from 20 by 200 and Matthew Stitchcomb from Etsy. Etsy. So, I mean, you know, and, and really, so sort of just a second about that is just, um, you know, being like understanding that there is a difference between having customers and having a community. Right. And you can be. You know, you could be making a trillion dollars a quarter and have, you know, so many new customers that you can't even count them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a community. It doesn't necessarily mean there's anything that draws them together or you have anything in your company that people are going to be so passionate about that they're going to want to, uh, you know, sort of assemble around your brand. Right, right. All right, I have one last question, then we're going to try to take some from the audience, though I'm having trouble pulling this up, but I do have some that went in before. But... Um, See, I see you guys as sort of emblematic of a movement um, that is around connecting consumers directly with the, the creator of the product in a way that feels fundamentally different from, you know, going to the Gap or whatever. I mean, I get a, a vegetable box delivered every week from a local, you know, um, com uh, community-supported agriculture, and there, it, with it comes a sheet of, you know, what happened on the farm that week, and, and, and you know, we're, we're planting the strawberries, so I know, you know, we'll get those, you know, in a couple months. There's all, there are all these different signals of this happening, and, and you guys are sort of one of them. Where, where else do you see this going? What other businesses would you like to see built around that idea, and how is it manifest in your own lives? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that there's just kind of a change in our culture right now where um, people want to know the story behind things, of where they came from. You see that in a lot of the green movement that's happening right now. A lot of people are wanting to know, you know, where this thing was made. And on Threadless, you, you're learning about where the design came from and, you know, the story of the 14-year-old girl in Japan who made the t-shirt that you're wearing is an interesting thing to know and it's a conversation piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that it's exciting that more products are having stories being told behind them. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of, like, the Tom's Shoes company, I'm a big fan of, how he's uh, giving a, a pair of shoes to a child in Africa for every pair of shoes that somebody buys. Um, I think that these kind of stories are definitely where things are headed. I mean, we uh, are used to things getting mass produced and not really caring where they came from, but I think people are um, learning that it's, it's good to know. Other examples? Yeah, I mean, I also think that it's, I mean, it, it's, it's also happening not on accident, well, not on accident, but as a result of, I mean, you know, the economy, you know, you look at everything from um, record labels starting to fail and artists are wanting to you know, cut out the middleman and their connections to their fans, and fans want to be directly connected to their, to the artists that they like. Um, you know, sites like, like Etsy, where you know people people want to be able to communicate with the person that's making the goods that they're buying. Um, there's starting there's some uh, sites around you know artisan-made foods that are coming up where you can basically, in the way that you get your vegetables, you know, you could buy chocolate or honey or soap or whatever and you're dealing directly with the producer. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, as a result of the economy kind of, you know, not doing that well, it's, it's forcing, it's, it's, it, it's eliminating the middleman because it has to, mm -hmm. but I think that it's something that both sides want. I think that the artists want to be um, more connected with their consumers and I think that the consumers are a lot more interested in the story behind, you know, what they're consuming. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I've got a question from the audience, and I'm sorry, I'm taking them from what I printed off before I got on stage in case the computer didn't work, but um, I think this is Suzanne Axtell asks, uh, from Santa Rosa. Uh, what is the most surprising or unexpected thing that you've learned from starting Treadless? I think that um, that many people want T-shirts. I mean, it, it really just, like, I didn't even think that it was possible to sell that many t I mean. It's it was been it's been pretty cool to see the business grow to its size. I didn't, I mean, the fact that it has that much potential, I think, was really exciting for me. I mean, I think that, I mean, it's it's mostly just been surprising, um, in a in a completely pleasant way that, you know, we were able to build a company where it's just, it's like a bunch of friends, you know, doing things that were all common sense with really no experience in doing the things that we are doing now. And it was really just sort of, you know, why not? You know, so we, don't, we don't know how to do that, but so why don't we just do it in a way that makes the most sense to us and that, um, and that we kind of, you know, prove to ourselves and, um, you know, that we were able to get things accomplished in a non-traditional way and that we didn't have to, you know, f learn about how to do something before you do it. There's many ways to get something accomplished and as long as you have the determination to just figure it out and, you know, take the many, many, many failures <laughs> that it takes to actually, you know, move forward. Um, I mean, I think that that's, I think that's like the most interesting thing that we've learned because that sort of fuels how we continue to build our business, which is just moving forward on, um, on things regardless of whether we know how to do them because we just kind of have this attitude that, well, we'll just figure it out. Right. Good work. All right, one last question, um, and this is from your fan, Cindy Gonzalez, in Los Angeles. You were both young designers when you started Threadless. Um, was there anything that scared you about running a business, and how did you conquer your fear? No, there was nothing that scared me about um, about continuing to do my hobby. <laughs> I mean, that's, <laughs> that's really what it was, is that yeah. it wasn't a business in the beginning, so there were no fear. I mean, it was just fun, so... Yeah. Um, I think being able to just, I think, I knew nothing about t-shirts, my background is a web designer, but just the confidence of being able to say, it's not that hard, I mean, I'll just figure it out and getting it done, I mean, 
it's a good way to overcome fears. Great. Well, thanks a lot. You guys have been wonderful. It was Thank a you. Great honor to interview. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks.